<laughs> well, you're going to be learning something today that is going to blow you away. Jill Stephanie Wagner, tell us what you're going to do. I'm going to take a uh, painting that I started that I was never happy with and try and resuscitate it. Bring so it you're going to resuscitate a failed painting. That's exciting because we all have more of those than we have that are not. We so should. we're... We're excited to hear that. We're going to get right to that in just a minute. Let's get started. It's Art School Live with Eric Rose. Now, here's your host, Eric Rose. Welcome to Art School Live. I'm Eric Rhodes, publisher of Fine Arts Connoisseur, Plen Air Magazine, and Numerous, numerous art newsletters, including Plein Air uh, Today, which just has gone to a daily. I know it was named today, but it was only weekly, but now it's daily. And we got a new one coming out this month in just a couple of weeks. And so you want to hang out and find out about that. Jill Stephanie Wagner is an incredible artist, and she is going to be our guest today. And she's going to take you a failed painting. She's also going to show how to take a failed reference photograph, in other words, a crummy reference photograph, and turn it into something amazing. That's the uh, crummy reference photograph. It's good composition, but not a great photo. So you'll get to see how that works. We have a prize today. If you put a comment in the comment section, uh, no matter where you are in the world, you could win the easel brush clip from easelbrushclip.com. Clip it on your easel or your studio easel, your plein air easel, I've got one on each, uh, sometimes two on each, and they're fabulous. And uh, we're also going to learn a little bit uh, uh, more about Jill and what she has to offer. We have a, uh, a book. It's an e-book called 45 Pastel Pointers from the Pros, including uh, seven bonuses. And so you want to get that, just go to pastellive.com slash 45 tips. Uh, the winner uh, from the last show is Ginger Atkins in Port Portsmouth, Virginia. I'm wondering if uh, that's, yeah, that sounds familiar. I guess we didn't announce that yet. And I want to just tell you briefly that Jill has a new video out called Five Step Pastel Painting, and it is fabulous. She's boiled it down to five steps and something you want. We'll talk more about that. Uh, but first, let's get right to Jill Stephanie Wagner. Jill, you're back. Hey, everyone. All right. So I'm going to let you go ahead and take it away. Okay. Um, I want to tell you that I'm an addicted plein air painter. But nine or ten years ago, I didn't even know what plein air painting was. I graduated from the U of M uh, University of Michigan Art School, and nobody really talked about painting outdoors, and they certainly didn't mention the word pastel. But um, I found out about it about 10 years ago, and I've been painting ever since outdoors. Um, I especially love plein air festivals. And I don't know if any of you guys participate in them, but I wanted to tell you a little bit about why I love them. Um, I love going to a new location and finding scenes that I've never seen before and, and trying to capture them. Um, I really, really love meeting all my artist friends. You know, we often don't see each other for a couple months at a time and it's great to be together. Um, I love talking to the patrons who are interested in buying my art. And I really love the competition aspect of it. And I know some artists don't like that, but um, it's very similar to the way that I've worked in advertising. Uh, come up with a concept, think about what the best solution is, implement, and then move on to the next thing. So um, it's really been a wonderful thing for me. Um, the problem I, is sometimes some of your paintings don't make the grade and you right. just got to give them up. So what I'm going to do today is uh, work on one that I started in um, uh, at Paint Grand Travers Plein Air Festival last summer. Um, and I had worked on it for a while. I was tired. It would like my third or fourth painting of the day, the light had changed and I, I just I just had to give it up and hope that I could uh, bring it back sometime later. Um, so I thought I'd try today, no promises. We'll see what happens, but- No, um, no, you have to promise to, you're gonna have to <laughs> knock it out of the park. I'm sorry, there's no, no, no other acceptable alternative. <laughs> well, um, th this, is, this is the painting that I stopped on and um, 
what I want to do is bring it back to what I was actually feeling at that point. And I always, you know, whether I'm working plein air or in my studio, I always follow some certain steps to help me um, consolidate in my mind what I want to do and then carry that through in the painting. So one of the first things I do is say, why? Why did this view catch my heart? Why does it make me want to paint it? Um, and for me, this was about friends in the sun um, enjoying each other. Uh, somebody else might pick a completely different love note, but I would usually put um, a little note on my easel somewhere to remind me, this is the story. This is what I wanna um, bring to, to my art. Then um, the next thing I would do is uh, figure out where my focal point is. How can I draw the viewer into my painting? Um, and if you saw on the reference photo, um, there's a highlighted area where people are sitting on a deck and it has the place where the most contrast is, the lightest lights and the darkest darks. It also has the place where there's the most color is and it has a wonderful lead in to the focal point. So all those things tell me that's where I want my focal point to be. The focal point isn't always the same as what the story is about, but in this case, it is. Um, and what I try to do with my focal point is I use the rule of thirds. I divide my paper vertically and horizontally um, in thirds. And then I try and hit my focal points near to one of these areas. Um, it's much more interesting than just putting something smack dab in the middle or off the side, what, which would lead you out of the painting. So I chose pretty much that area. And you can see that's where it is in my, in my painting. Um, my reference photo was shot from a slightly different position. Um, so it's not an exact replica of that. And even if it was, I don't try and absolutely match a photo. We, we, we're not even look, allowed to look at photos when we're painting in festivals. Some people do, but <laughs> it's against the rule. <laughs> So the next thing I do is uh, a real quick value sketch. Um, and again, um, I do that because the light shifts so quickly. Um, and if you don't um, set in stone where you want your values to be, you can tend to chase them as the light moves across the sky. So this shows that that's my focal point, my darkest darks, my lightest lights. Um, I have my lead in, the rest of it's kind of blurry, but um, I know that that's, that's where I want to highlight. And I, I also want to add some um, directional lines from plants that I'm going to add in there that will also draw your eye to the focal point. Exciting. Well, let's do it. Okay. Um, the first thing I want to do is reinforce some of my darks. It's um, interesting because we're in kind of a dark studio, so it's, it's hard for me to see with the light, but um, I'm going to make sure that I have my darkest areas in. And I, I should tell you, before, before I did this, I, I sprayed it down. And people ask me all the time what kind of fixative I use and do I spray my final painting. I never spray my final painting. But at this point where I know I'm gonna rework it, um, fixative can give you a little more texture. Um, and this has gotten blurred and um, smeared. So doing it now is a good thing because I'm making this layer kind of um, permanent and I'm gonna build other layers on top of it. I know, um, there's some artists who use fixatives um, at the end of their paintings, but I found that every one of them, even if they say that they're not going to um, affect the look, they do somehow. They either 
smear the colors together, or darken them, or, or leave dots um, of where the spray had hit. Um, so I, I tend to stay away from that. I want to I want to reinforce the lead-in, um, which is this line here. I, I want it to be kind of irregular and not take too much attention, but I want, I want it to be a shape that draws you back up into the focal point area. And the next thing I, I really want to do is um, reinforce, actually I'm going to reinforce the darks in my focal point. It's always better to put darks in and then with, with pastel and work your lights over them. If you put light in and then try and work dark over it, you get a real muddy effect that um, is not attractive, <laughs> say. So I'm also going to um, pick up the highlights um, on these people because what I'm going to do after that is cut away into them with, with the really light area that's behind them. And this is kind of weird the way this umbrella went because they're not actually under the umbrella. Um, so they're, they're, the light is still coming a little bit from the top. So their hair, the top of their shoulders, all of that would actually have almost like a rim, a top rim light. It's a little hard to see your mark making uh, because your hand kind of blocks it. Yeah. It's kind of hard to paint on camera anyway, isn't it? Because you have to step off it to is. the side. They wanted me to, to work from the other side, but then I would have had to work <laughs> inside out. So I'll try and keep it down. Putting a little bit of the, um, more of the highlights in the area around. There would be a, a shadow under the table. So I don't want to highlight that. With pastel, do you have to do a buildup, a layering? Um, pastel is so diverse. You can you can use it all different ways. Um, I usually do a wet um, value painting first. Um, I didn't on this one. I, I worked right on the paper, um, although this paper is really good at taking a water or a, a liquid underpainting. Um, but people work all different ways. Um, sometimes I use a, um, a prepared board that I've made myself or, or my wonderful <laughs> assistant, Tia, helps make for me. Hey, um, Tia, is there any way you can move that camera in a little closer? So now, now I'm, uh, I'm cutting into the real rough uh, areas of the people to make them pop out a little bit more. You're creating more contrast, right? Exactly. So there'll be no doubt where I want my viewer's eye to go because if you don't tell them, they're gonna look for something on their own and it may not be the place that you want them to go. So I'm also gonna really brighten that sky up um, often at the horizon, you get a pinkish warm tone that happens. So I'm, I'm going to drop that in too, which will make them pop out a little bit more. I 
I don't I don't want that tangent of his head touching right up against the umbrella so I'm kind of carving him out of there and as I go farther away from the focal point I don't want to be so bright so I'm letting that kind of darken a little bit do you want to talk about that real briefly about focal points um and, and why you do that? Um, I'm not sure where I actually um, was taught that, but it just appears to me in a lot of paintings, you wander aimlessly um, and there's not a, a compositional direction to point you at one specific spot. And if, if I go through this process of saying it's really important to me to show these friends on a sunny day having fun, then that's, I need to work to make that happen. Um, if I made the highlights down here, that's where somebody's eyes are going to go. You can't stop them because our eyes almost always go to the darkest darks and the lightest lights and to where there's the most color. So you can pretend that's not true, but in reality, um, that's the way we see. And we also um, see less detail in the areas where we're not focusing. So if this is your focal point, um, there's gonna be more detail there and all the rest of the areas, the peripheral areas um, become maybe blurred or less contrasty because that's how our eye sees. If you, if you you know, wherever you are, if you take a look across the room and, and focus on something, that will be in perfect detail. But the rest of the things in that room are not going to be in that much detail. And especially in plein air painting, um, I think that's the feeling you, I at least want to get across is look at this, look at this. I'm going to bring the highlights up also on the umbrella because if the light's coming a lot from above, it would be lighter up there. I had an interesting experience this week, Jill. I was, I'm working on this painting of Russia, and it's a sunset painting, and it's got a barn in it with a road leading into the barn, and I loved it, but I realized it was fighting. I had two focal points, ah. so I had to decide which one do I want to emphasize the sunset or the, or the house. And I finally decided to emphasize the house. So I really muted the sunset back and man, it just really worked. So I think that's a great lesson. Yes. And, and it's not wrong to have two focal points. It's just that, like you said, one has to be dominant over the other, or you confuse, <clears throat> you confuse your viewer. I'm just going in and trying to give, this umbrella a little little more structure and then some lights underneath Hey, whoever's watching, if you went to Pastel Live, just say something in the comments. I did. <laughs> I know you did. <laughs> you taught. <laughs> the nice thing about Pastel, too, um, I I'm an oil painter as well, but one of the things I really like about Pastel is it's easy to merge colors together. And if you use um, two colors that are slightly different, but the same value, you can create kind of a vibrating effect. So on the top, on the top of that um, umbrella, I merged a yellowish gold and then also a kind of orangish gold to, to get that effect. And 
you know, I, I don't want this to feel like it's completely light on the bottom and not there's a, a line of where the color gets bluer. I want to kind of let that fold into each other. So again, I kind of overlaying another color over one. And I'll bring some of that blue in here too. <clears throat> so that's kind of the first round of highlighting that up. Um, I need to show the, the light that would be hitting people's shoulders as well. So you said it's the first round. Do you, so you, you typically take this in steps then? Well, actually, I should say it's the um, it's the second round because the first round was what I got down on site. But um, I I don't want to do all of the detail into this quite yet because it may change as I go. Now I'm curious because you in your video you talk about five step pastel painting. And I know the video tells us what the five steps are, but is this part of that process in your five steps? Yep. Um, my love note is my first step. Um, uh, I do a pencil drawing of the big shapes as my second step, step for composition. Then this is my third step for um, values. No 10, yeah. A and... And then I get I do an underpainting of those values onto my um, paper, and then the very last step is color, because if you don't do all of those four steps, at least I find if I don't do all those four steps first, it doesn't matter how much color I throw on it, uh, it's it's just not going to ring true. So we'll put a link to the video in the comments section if you uh, want to know the detail about the five steps and how she accomplishes it. And you want to learn about pastel painting. It's no better teachers. Um, Jill is terrific. Five step pastel painting. It's at uh, stream. At, it's actually now at PaintTube.tv. Uh, we've now moved all the brands to PaintTube. Can you still get it at uh, Creative Catalyst? Well, you still can, but Creative Catalyst is now uh, becoming part of PaintTube. So you can get it on both right now, but soon Creative Catalyst, PaintTube, and Lilidol all become the same thing. Okay. I like what you're doing there with the, uh, the shadow, the, the blue of the shadow. And I love the fact that you can, you can see some of that warmth coming through. Yeah, yeah. Um... The other great thing about pastel is depending on how hard you um, put pressure on the pastel, you can get all different types of um, responses. So uh, I don't know if you can see it on online, but there's you know four or five different colors that are shining through here. Um, and not that I want them to stand out, but um, they, it, they fall, uh, they, they feel more realistic because Stones aren't just one color most of the time, and these are all in shadow. So looking at my picture here, um, I'm going to have to throw some more shadow right in here where the umbrella is forming. You know, when you put that one, just that one bright streak down, it changed everything. That's, that's bold and gutsy painting. <laughs> Like, go big or go home. <laughs> <laughs> I don't want those highlights, though, to get too far away from my focal point. Uh, Jill, you're going to be teaching at the plein air convention. I am. I'm going to... Um, be doing a demo in the expo hall um, and I'm, I'm 
also be a field painter. So, so for the people who don't know what any of that means. Oh, well, um, there's different types of faculty and I've, I've been a, um, a demo artist twice um, in the pastel room. And then usually after that, you're a, a field painter who goes out when we go out every single um, afternoon and paint some unbelievable place that you guys have found for us. And uh, we paint or go around and help people. So I had a great time in San Francisco and Tucson and um, Santa Fe, no, San Diego. <laughs> One of those one of those S places out West. I had a woman come up to me at the plein air convention and she said, I'm over the moon. I said, what do you mean? She said, well, I was outside painting. You know, I don't really know how to do this very well. And, um, and I saw a flag. And so you know, our, our faculty carry flags, right? So when they're walking around, so people can spot them and we give them a card so they can wave that card. It's bright so that they can kind of, you know, make sure that, that they're spotted. She said, this guy came over and it was Matt Smith. Ah. <laughs> and she said, and Matt Smith spent 20 minutes with me and he, you know, he helped me get a breakthrough. It's like, where else can that happen? Not very often. But it's funny you should mention that because I signed up with Matt Smith to do a year long tutorial um, mentorship. Um, and he is an amazing guy. I don't, is he going to be here at Pace this year? I don't think he's on the agenda this year. I know um, you always bring in new people, so to keep it fresh. It's, it's again, one of the things that changed my life when I went there the first time and saw these unbelievable painters who I would never have had the chance to see on my own teach me things, even though I was there as faculty, teach me something new every day and and to be able to go from back and forth from different um demos anytime you want and you know you don't have to sign up for something and stick with it you, you can experience a little bit of everybody's i don't know if you know this but uh one of the reasons i created the, the plein air convention is i had gone to an event called weekend with the masters which was a really wonderful show but as I talked to people, one of the things I found out is that you had to sign up, you pay a flat fee, and then you had to sign up and pay for every class. Yeah. And sometimes you didn't get into the class you hoped you'd get into, and you got into something you didn't want to be in. And so I thought, well, what if we just did one that's a flat rate? You can go to any class, anytime, be a part of it, and go, you know, if you don't like a class, you move to another class. And uh, I'll tell you, it really works. Yeah, it, it's much more attendee um, focused. Um, it's not about what the convention wants you to do. It's it's about what the people who attend want. And um, I love that. Well, this year is going to be uh, interesting because we're already more than 50% sold out. And Ooh. I think it's going to sell out early because we're all so anxious to get back and see our friends and get out and paint together and, and, uh, and, but we put a guarantee on it. So if you have to drop out, depending on what happens with COVID, you can either reschedule or get your money back. That's, that's wonderful too. There's no, there's no risk. Well, the risk is to us because we may have <laughs> yeah. to pay the hotel anyway. So ooh, ooh. <laughs> we got stuck on that. We had to cancel our face conference. And uh, we canceled it. And the hotel said, no, you don't need to cancel it because it's okay here. And we said, well, you, we can't get people to sign up. This was right in the middle of COVID. And uh, so they sued us. Oh. And uh, we settled, uh, but we ended up costing us a lot of money uh, because we, we canceled. And so, you know, things like that we have to deal with. But we're not going to put that on you. And, and then you'll have people forever grateful. That's the goal. <laughs> now tell us what you're doing now. 
I'm going back in and reinforcing lights, um, trying to make sure that I have a lead in, but um, don't take away from my focal point. Have believable light. The thing about painting outdoors is you almost can't be sla a slave to a reference photo because things are changing pretty quickly. And what you need to do is just capture your original um, intent as best as you can. You know, Jill, I wrote a piece yesterday about plein air painting. And <clears throat> basically what I said in the piece is that it will it revolutionizes your painting. If you've been a studio painter your whole life and you go outdoors, you'll realize how much you've been missing from just painting from photographs. You think you're getting yes. it all, but but can you speak to that just briefly? Uh, it's so true because like I said, I hadn't really understood the whole plein air um, way of thinking um, until a couple years ago. And it did make me realize that by painting photos, I was trying to paint every detail. I was trying to exactly follow what that photograph did instead of making my best painting. Um, and it, there's the time issue that makes it somewhat difficult and maybe hard to get used to, but it also, starts making you work intuitively because you don't have time to you know look at every little teeny weeny detail and try and copy it into your painting you you uh especially because of the light changing and time restraints when you're at a festival you you have to prioritize i guess is the word um and with a photo, it's hard to prioritize because you, you see everything and everything's in the same detail. Everything's in the same, um, it has the same importance in a, in a photo. And sometimes when that's in front of you, it's hard to make your own decisions to change it because oh, that's not what the photo looks like. But you have to give the photo up at some point. And what I do when I work from photos is I, I use them to help me start with composition and, and maybe st structure or perspective. And then at some point I don't, I just put them away and work on the painting. So, a great way to learn about uh, painting uh, is to, with, from Jill's video. It's called five step pastel painting and you can find it in the comments. We'll put a link to it. Also, of course, the plein air convention, what a great place to learn. We have a beginner's day. And that's a, a terrific thing to do is because we show you all the different mediums, uh, how to do it in oil, you know, pastel, et cetera. And also how to set up easels and how to, what, what works differently outdoors. And then we have an event called Plein Air Live coming up in March. Uh, we have not announced the full faculty yet, but we've got some amazing faculty so far. And then of course there's Plein Air Magazine. So if you uh, want to learn all about Plein Air, uh, start out with Plein Air Magazine. It costs you, I don't know, 30, 40 bucks a year, and uh, it's well worth it. And it's a wonderful place to advertise. Thank you. <laughs> Why is that? <laughs> I mean, you, you come from the advertising industry, so I'm curious why you say that. <laughs> well, it, you, you know, like I've always said before, you have to find out who your target audience is. But if you're a, a painter and you do a lot of workshops, um, it's a way to talk to the people who are, are looking for instruction. Um, I know that um, there's, this, I think maybe a third of your people are actually art collectors. Um, and I know artists are a lot of art collectors, but um, there's also a fine art connoisseur, which you know, tracks more toward collectors. Um, and, uh, you know, the bottom line is if you don't get yourself out there, nobody else is going to. So. Well, and you have to make a commitment at, at 
plein air convention, we teach art marketing. And maybe maybe you should be on that with me since you've been an advertising person. <laughs> but, uh, you know, it's once you make a commitment to be a, a professional artist, you, you have to assume that you're going to be out there all the time. You've got to, you got to keep it visible all the time. Well, and consider it, it's a cost of doing business. I mean, yeah. we can all want to be artists and um, think that we're special and that we don't need to do that kind of stuff. <laughs> and what I often say is, well, good, don't do it then. <laughs> because the rest of us benefit if you don't do it. You, you have to be in front of people's eyes um, to, to keep them remembering you. And advertising is one way of doing that. Social media, um, uh, Instagram, you know, doing videos, doing workshops, doing all that kind of stuff. Yeah, and, and coming from the ad industry, you understand this. And that is that you can never have everything. I always use the Parthenon as an example. Uh, the pillars in the Parthenon. Imagine if the Parthenon is being held up by one pillar. Um, yeah. one pillar, let's say, what if your strategy is social media? Let's say it's Facebook. Well, uh, the other day, one of our artists, a very prominent artist had a oh, couple hundred sorry. thousand, had a couple hundred thousand followers on, on, uh, Facebook and he posted a nude and they permanently deleted him and he lost his, uh, you know, a very primary thing for him. And so uh, that's why you don't want to have everything on a single pillar. You need to do social media. You need to do advertising. You need to do shows. You need to do a every possible thing you can do. Uh, and those are all marketing. Yeah. You just got to think of them as something you have to put your money into. I a saw lot of work. other unbelievable artist who got everything, all her Instagram just taken away from her and all her likes for you know years years of working on it well that happened to camille preswanik recently yeah. Yeah, she got spammed and uh she got lucky though because she got it all back because she found somebody who knew somebody at instagram but she oh. was she was lucky in the beginning she thought she had lost it all seven years of Working on it. You know, I, I spend a lot of money on Instagram. I have Instagram consultants that I use and people like that. And so every dollar invested over years is lost if you post one nude or you post one thing that they don't like. Yeah. You know, so I stay away from controversy. Yeah. But isn't that, isn't it sad that a nude would be considered controversy? I mean, I do, I used to before this pandemic hit did figure drawing quite a lot classes um and i still haven't i don't think put any figures on my instagram or facebook for that very reason but that's kind of sad yeah well it is but then there are people out there who don't understand uh what it is we do yeah so Anyway, it's not up to us. It's up to them. And, it, yeah. and we have to play by their rules. It's their toy. Yeah. And, and we're not actually paying for it. So <laughs> we have even less input. Well, we're making good progress. Well, how, how are we doing on time? Oh, we're doing okay. You, you, could, uh, you could take another 10 if you needed to. It's, it's the problem with this setup that it's hard to get back far enough because I'm usually... Yeah, you got a tripod right there in front of yeah. you. Yeah. Well, I love what you did by pointing the uh, leaves towards the focal point. That's, uh, I call it arrows. Yeah. And that's a, a, a great artist trick. As a matter of fact, you know, you've got, if you look at the pole going up for the the um, uh, the umbrella, there's a little leaf right there, right below your hand, right yeah. there. See that little green leaf? Yep. Yeah. That, so that's also an arrow that's pointing to them. And all of those leaves are kind of pointing down their arrows. I think that's all very good.
I like to put up a little tab uh, in the corner of my painting so I can remind myself where the sun is coming from. Mm -hmm. Because I sometimes I forget and then I have Some light people, on. I've seen on the road do this. Yeah. Yep. You know, or here or here. Yeah. Because, like I said, in a little while, it's not that. <laughs> Well, I could fuss on this a little bit longer, but um, one of the, I had a tip that I want to do. All right. Um, actually, this is another piece that I did on the same paper um, in northern Michigan. Um, so it's just nice how you can see some of the color through. On this one, it's been eaten up a lot, but some of the ground cover covers the same as the paper. It's interesting. Um, but one thing I wanted to tell people, I know sometimes either we're copying a photo or we're working on a, um, a planner painting in the studio and, you know, we're afraid that we think we know what we want to do to change it, but we're not quite sure. So we're a little timid about doing it. I found this cool way that I never would have thought of because, you know, Eric, I had to practice for this. I, I took that original painting that I had up here before I started working on it. And I photographed that. And then I printed it on matte photo paper. And I worked on the painting on top of that painting, you know, the fell painting that was underneath. Now this will, this can never stay because it's on uncoated and un, um, sanded paper. It would, you know, just smear away. But it was helpful in me, you can see, I, I still have quite a ways to go, but I answered the questions that I wanted to answer for the painting um, here instead of, you know, trying to work them in on here. So this would work great also for studio paintings where you've got a great big piece and, you know, it's scary to make a, a major change, but you could make it on, you know, a color printout. You know, that's a good idea because sometimes I'll let a, a plein air piece go. Somebody wants to buy it. I typically don't sell my plein air pieces, but once in a while I do and I regret it. And then I, you know, I go back to the photograph of the, of the original scene instead of a photograph of the painting. I think that's a great idea. Well, you can really see what a difference. See, I, there's a lot of lightning that has to happen and, um, you know, a few more design element things. Yeah, I see that. I hope you guys are enjoying this. If you are, please make a comment. Remember, we have a, a, a prize today, an easel brush clip for comments. We'd love it when you say where you're from. We have people from all over the world tuning in. Tell us where you're from. That's always fun to see. Linda Powell says the hotel is sold out. Linda, I don't think that's true uh, for the plein air convention. I'll double check on that. There may be some misinformation out there. You have to, you have to go to the link on the plein air convention site and use that link. The hotel may be sold out, but our rooms are not sold out. I don't think they are. I got mine already. I got it. You Kathy asked, do you have to stay at the same hotel? No, you don't have to. You can stay wherever you want, but it's more fun to stay at the hotel because then you can drink at night. <laughs> and we do it. There, There is a fair amount of people doing that. And we sit up and we play guitar and we sing. And we had to shut that down too because somebody complained about our noise. That's why we want to sell out every room. Where it's just us. Then we don't have any local, uh, any other guests in the hotel. <laughs> That's, you know, part of the best part of the, um, I mean, there's lots of things that are great about Pace, but <clears throat> just seeing your old friends and um, spending time together. What if you don't have any old friends? <laughs> then you make new friends. I, I mean, the first time I came, I, I had wanted to come for years, but family or business or <clears throat> money, you know, got in the way. 
and then you asked me to be faculty. And when I came, it was like, oh my God, this is amazing. Um, everybody's so kind and helpful. Even the biggest names, um, you know, were, were kind and, and helped other people along. And, you know, that's cool. Yep. I see Newfoundland tuning in. Newfoundland, tell us where in Newfoundland you are, because I have a connection there. Uh, let's see where else other people are coming in. Italy. Hey, buongiorno. Come stai? Hey, I bet you can't wait to get back there. Yeah. Baghdad. Outstanding. Hello, Baghdad. This is so much fun when we... Here's, here's an odd one. Queens, New York. <laughs> <laughs> Just kidding. Now, before we wrap up, and we should wrap up, I know there's a lot more you could do on this. Mm -hmm. um, maybe you, did you have something else you were going to do? Or is this, is this your uh, plan? No, I could dance. No, but you could show us your studio. Oh, sure. All right. I, I also want um, you to meet Tia. My All right, Tia. Assistant, and she's a great artist on her own. Um, and she helps me with everything. Yay, Tia. <laughs> did, you, did you do it? Tia's. No. Hi, Tia. <laughs> Everybody applause for Tia. Okay, show us your studio real she's quickly. On the camera. Um, this is my business area. Um, I two computers basically because I'm really cheap and I won't get rid of my old Mac because I'd have to buy all new Adobe Illustrator by, um, software. Um, and There's your I video. Have, I have lots of art books here and my art supplies are in these ca cabinets. My um, packaging is in those cabinets. Um, and on this side, um, when I bring people in my studio, I have some paintings up. It's it's almost empty right now because I have a solo show starting tomorrow in Ann Arbor. Um, and it will go for a month and a half. It's called Close to Home because they're all paintings um, of Michigan, pure Michigan. Um, and it's it's been in the works for, I don't know, over two years, but kept getting postponed because of COVID. And then we decided to go ahead with it. Looks like you got a little kitchenette there too. Nice. And I also have a lot of storage for paintings. And what a great idea to use the cab oh, the ca cabinet covers is for hanging paintings. All right. A bar, because you know, sometimes you need a bar. <laughs> <laughs> and framing. Um, almost all my frames are gone right now, but. As a painter, you have to have tons of frames available. So I have a bathroom and another storage area in the back. Oh, you're organized. Very <laughs> impressive. And a poker table. Well, see, it used to be my husband's um, man, man cave. cave. So it used to be all poker tables, pool tables, all sorts of things. But I ripped out most of that stuff. <laughs> cool. Outstanding. Well, thank you so much, Jill, for, for being on with us today. It was a fabulous demo. We really enjoyed it. Everybody give Jill a round of applause. If you thank enjoyed you this, me, if you guys enjoyed this, please pass it on by hitting a share button wherever you are. Uh, we would love it if you would um, visit Jill's website, which we have put in the comments section. And, of course, Jill's got a, a brand new video out, which is, let's see if I can find it here. Uh, right there, five-step pastel painting. So, uh, Jill, thank you so much. We'll see you at the plein air convention and hopefully see you soon. And uh, thanks again. You really taught us some great lessons today. Thanks so much, Eric. All right. Thank you. Our guest today is Jill Stephanie Wagner and a fabulous, fabulous artist, fabulous pastel painter as well. I want to show you guys something. Now, this is not done, and I'm not very big on showing things that are not done, but I mentioned it. Uh, and Elaine Miller got on and said, show me. So this is the painting that I'm working on. And this is a Russian scene. I've still got some things I've got to fix.
But the idea was that I had a really, really, really bright sunset back there, and then I had the road going into the house. I had to make a decision. Do I focus on the house or do I focus on the sunset? Because it's either a painting about a house or a sunset. I wanted it to be about the house. This is a house I saw in Russia. I literally took this at 60 miles an hour driving by. And uh, I actually used two different photographs to comp compose this. But that's the idea is that you want to have one focal point, primary focal point, and then you can have a secondary or tertiary, but you want to mute them back or change it so that they're not taking the full uh, full advantage. Now, we've got an event coming up this month. I want to just show you this real quick. Join the world for Watercolor Live, the ultimate watercolor learning event, January 26th to 29th. Four days of online art lessons from top master watercolor artists from around the globe. Learn to paint nature, people, cityscapes, flowers, and more. Become a better artist. Click the link to learn more and get our free ebook, 101 Watercolor Secrets from the Top Masters. And we have a free ebook for you. If you like pastel or want to learn about it, go to pastellive.com, 45 tips. It's slash 45 tips. Also, if you would like to subscribe to this program, go on YouTube. I'm trying to get my numbers up. I've got to get it to 100,000. That's my goal for the first six months of this year. So you can help me do that. Uh, I get a plaque. I'll put the plaque up there on the wall. And, uh, and so just go to YouTube to Streamline Art and uh, find, find it and subscribe. Hit the little notification bell. Also, if you'd follow on Instagram and Facebook, that would be really cool. We really appreciate that. It's just at Eric Rhodes. Well, thank you for tuning in today. And thanks again to Jill Stephanie Wagner. She's a rock star. We're honored to have her on our team at the Plein Air Convention and on our videos. And, and uh, these things are all about you. They're not about us. They're not about the artist. They're about you. And what I mean by that is that it's our goal to make your life better, to make you a better painter. And when you're better, you're less frustrated in your life. You're, you're more satisfied with your life because you're doing what you love and you're doing it well. And those of us who really want to do it well, we're always trying to get ourselves to the next level. We start here then we go to here, then we go to here. Sometimes we have a big breakthrough. And that's what this is all about. All these videos, all these virtual conferences, magazines, conventions, it's all about making you better. And that's our job in life to do that for you. And of course, if you want to help, excuse me, <clears throat> help others get better, then you can tell them about our stuff. Well, I've lost my voice. I apologize. But uh, thank you so much and have a terrific day. I'm Eric Rose. <laughs> ah! <laughs> Bye. <laughs>